Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar on lessons learned for the O2 Verlap Research Demonstration Project. First, let me introduce today's speakers. Okay, so with us today we have Dr. Carl Stepnowski. He is the scientific principal investigator of the study uh, from the Department of Medicine with the University of California, San Diego. And we also have Alicia Malanga. She is the administrative PI with the COPD Foundation. And I am Sergio Martinez, the project coordinator for the O2VLAP study, uh, also with the COPD Foundation. For those of you who are on a computer, I do want to point out that there is a chat box where you can type in a question um, as we go along. And um, if, time's allow, if time allows, we, we will go over some of those questions at the end of the presentation. If you are also joining us just by phone, um, we'll also take some questions at the end. All right, so today's meeting will cover a PCORnet overview. So we'll learn who PCOR, PCORnet is in a minute. Also, the study overview, identifying the lessons learned throughout the project. And since the project just ended, we do have some results where avail, um, available um, throughout these different phases of the project, um, like recruitment and study promotion, the eligibility phase, enrollment and sample characteristics of the study, CPAP data sharing, randomization and intervention, and CPAP adherence data and survey data. So let me turn the mic over to Dr. Carl Stepnowski for the next few slides. Great, hi everybody. Um, Sergio, can you hear me? I think yes. I'm unmuted. Yeah, we can Great. hear you. Yeah, we thought we'd start with an overview of, of PCORnet because this was a funded research demonstration project um, within PCORnet. So we just wanted to provide some, some background. Um, PCORnet's the National Patient-Centered Research Network. It was originally made up of both PPRNs, uh, which are patient-powered research networks, and CDRNs, which are clinical data research networks. PPRNs were collaborations between patient advocacy organizations and researchers, while CDRNs were partnerships between two or more healthcare organizations. Today, PCORnet is comprised of both CDRNs and what are called health plan research networks, HPRNs, uh, but not PPRNs. Um, PCORnet today is uh, comprised of over 857,000 providers from um, 357 healthcare systems. I couldn't find data on the number of, of patients, but this is a, a really large uh, uh, network. It's overseen by the central office of, of PCORnet. Next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about the original goals of the research demonstration project, because this isn't the, a typical uh, research study that's funded for a single uh, research study. Um, there are three main objectives of this project. Um, one was relevance to answer important patient identified research questions that were generated by our patient communities. And you'll notice I'll use the word communities for this particular project because we were working with two different medical conditions, both sleep apnea and COPD. Was, second goal was collaboration. So how well can we partner with other organizations within PCORnet, so other PPRNs, and in our case, we had a CDRN as well, to uh, work together to achieve um, project goals. And then an evaluation. So how well um, did we do what we said we were going to do? And were we able to contribute to the PCORnet Commons and to help increase PCORnet's capacity to, to do research? Next slide. So for our funded project, it was actually a series of three related projects. Project one was <laughs> to conduct a series of focus groups to obtain feedback from um, patients in our COPD and sleep apnea communities 
on the study, including measure selection, uh, the most relevant topics of interest, um, how um, uh, treatment of both conditions affected daily functioning, and then on intervention spe specifics. Um, based on what we learned from those series of focus groups really helped us refine our main study, which was project two. So project two was the main scientific study, which is the primary focus of this webinar. And then project three was an evaluation of the overall project, how well we worked with not only PCORnet uh, member um, PPRNs and CDRNs, but how we worked with, with others out in the community as well. And we also produced five, I think it was five webinars to contribute both to our patient communities and to PCORnet Commons. Next slide. So just uh, some brief background on uh, CBD and, and OSA. Um, sleep apnea affects about 17% of adults and over 25% of older adults. It's a relatively common chronic medical condition. Approximately 10 to 15% of individuals that, who have COPD also have sleep apnea. And it's a condition that's been commonly referred to as overlap syndrome, although it's not unique to COPD and OSA, but uh, it's commonly referred in the medical literature as overlap syndrome. And overlap affects about one to two million Americans. Um, sleep apnea is characterized by repeated cessations or stops or near stops of breathing during sleep. And we'll show an illustration on the next slide of what it looks like. The episodes are scored if they last 10 seconds or more and they have two main consequences. The first consequence is that most um, breathing episodes are ended with uh, an arousal from sleep. So the body actually wakes itself up for one to two or three seconds. Those repeated disruptions to sleep cause fragmented sleep and next day excessive daytime sleepiness. And then excessive daytime sleepiness leads to a whole host of, of issues. Um, the second main consequence are oxygen desaturation. So each time someone has a breathing episode, the oxygen level goes down and the heart rate goes up. And repeated on a nightly basis can be 50, 100, 300 times a night. It leads to cardiovascular stress or stress on the cardiovascular system and then risk of future cardiovascular conditions. Uh, individuals who have both COPD and OSA have significantly increased comorbidity and mortality rates compared to individuals diagnosed with just COPD or OSA alone. And one of the intriguing things, the reason why we started this project together was we thought, well, both are breathing disorders and both require the ongoing use of a medical device uh, for um, the primary therapy. Next slide. So this illustration shows on the left side what a normal airway looks like. Um, the breathing, uh, the breath goes through unimpeded. And on the right side, what happens is some combination of factors, whether it's the soft palate coming down, the tongue moving back, the body position at night, something causes the airway to be blocked either partially or all the way, and air cannot move through. And the gold standard achievement for sleep apnea is continuous positive airway pressure therapy, or CPAP, and what that does is it applies air pressure to the airway to keep the airway open throughout the night. Okay, next slide. So what we, the, 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 the study that we designed was a randomized trial of two interventions for patients diagnosed with both COPD and sleep apnea. Some of the inclusion criteria were being over the age of, 30, of 40, and um, having been prescribed and using CPAP therapy. This was a unique study. Most uh, CPAP-related adherence intervention studies um, are focused on brand new users. Our study focused on existing users. Uh, after talking with our patient communities, we realized that the, the two primary study outcomes were the amount of use, because to the extent that it's used and people sleep well at night, their daytime functioning is improved. And so daytime functioning and reduction of symptoms and overall sleep quality were the primary study outcomes. So we plan an enrollment of 330 participants over an 18 month time period. Next slide. Um, what we'll do throughout, as Sergio mentioned, is, is have these slides with blue highlighting that focus on uh, lessons learned from this project. 
Um, this was a, an, an ambitious national electronic only recruitment study of existing patients. And we had um, several areas that we really learned new lessons on that we want to share with, with the uh, patient communities and, and with future researchers. Uh, area one is on research study methods. Uh, we learned a lot about study promotion and conducting study promotional campaigns. Um, we also learned a lot about data, CPAP data sharing, which actually applies to potentially sharing data from any medical device in the future for research purposes. And then um, the third area we'll talk about our study results. So as each area comes up in, in our presentation, we'll have a slide on each of those areas. Next slide. All right. Sergio will take over from here. Yeah. All right, so this is a, a slide that shows the, the landing page. Um, because this was a national study, the entire project was done through this platform um, and done remotely. And this is the study, the overlap studies uh, flowchart. And what we'll be doing is just going th through it in sections. So we'll be diving in section by section and going through those uh, outcomes and results. So let's start at the top with the recruitment and study promotion. So for this study, there were a total of 1,315 registrations, unique participants who registered into the study. And of those, 657 consented to take part in the study. So again, this was all done online and it was all a self consent process um, on the www.02 or lab.org page. So 658, which is, which is 50%, did not sign the consent. These people were also contacted by phone and email to confirm that that was an intentional stopping point. Um, this, uh, this was actually one of the lessons learned because we learned that people, by, by doing these um, additional phone calls and emails, we learned that people didn't know that there was an additional step or were confused about the, the consent process. So this helped pe move people along that did want to take part. So some study promotion summary bullets. Um, the study relied nearly entirely on electronic recruitment methods, including emails, social media posts, and newsletters. The most effective recruitment source were emails that were directed to patients with both conditions, COPD and sleep apnea. And we learned throughout the study that recontact was important. Um, so there were campaigns that we had email, um, email sent two to four times to their community. This was important. We learned that each time we did that, um, we had a, 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 um, a, a good response. And then the responses didn't really decline the second or third, fourth time. We also continually tried to improve the email messaging. Um, so there were three iterations, the original email text. Um, and then later on, we added uh, friends and family text. So this message was directed to the per recipient, but also to share with any friends or family who, who may have the, the two conditions. And at the end of the study, we also revised the text to let them know that the study was ending and it was their last chance to join. Facebook was the most effective social media source and newsletters were the third best campaign source. In total, we, we reached out to 35 different campaigns to help promote for the study. So an estimated 152,000 emails were sent overall and over 500,000 posts were viewed in social media. This shows a list of all the campaigns that we uh, used to promote the study. Um, they're organized by their community, COPD, OSA, the Cornet and miscellaneous. So the, the second column is the, the audience, whether it was a, an email uh, camp audience or a Facebook audience or a newsletter audience. Um, and then the far right column is the number of the, of the reach, which is the number of people that um, invitation reached. If it was emails, that's the number of emails that was sent for that audience. If it was Facebook, that's the number of people that message was viewed. And if it was a newsletter, that's the circulation that that newsletter had. Um. Okay, so thanks, Sergio. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, sorry. 
Um, so in terms of lessons learned related to study promotion and our recommendations for PCORNET um, as a demonstration project, we definitely recommend that for um, electronic studies, you know, as Sergio described, which is really what this was, that you include several onboarding steps and that you create a plan that, that really gives a point of contact at each step because we did find that the um, point of contact at each step was able to get more and more people recruited into the study. And so it, it was very important that we had that, that stepwise fashion. Not everybody um, sort of works in the same fashion and some people require, you know, additional contact at different steps through the study sort of recruitment process and through the study itself. And so that was very important. And we do think that should communi be communicated to other studies who are considering this format. Um, we also recommend that PCORNET consider having a dedicated social media specialist um, that studies can use as a, as a resource. Um, we have things that we found specifically from this study, um, you know, recontact was critically important. Um, obviously, the messaging was important. You know, we tested a few different messages and, and they really did um, work in different ways and resonate with different um, types of populations. And in some cases, um, folks that responded to our messaging were folks that didn't meet the full criteria of the study. And so we realized that our messaging was potentially, um, you know, not as clear as it could have been. And so we, we um, you know, changed that trajectory and got, a, you know, better messaging. And so if there were somebody from PCORNET who could really provide um, that type of, of education, we did feel that that would be important. And we certainly felt that you should have, um, you know, anybody doing this type of study should be A-B tested on smaller samples to really see, you know, what messaging works before you send it out to, um, you know, sort of the, the, the breadth of, um, of potential, you know, enrollees. Um, and overall, we felt that, that if you put that effort in, um, in terms of testing and having correct messages, um, you would have a better return on the campaign itself. And so you would actually need um, you know, fewer campaigns to, to reach your recruitment goals. So we really do want to stress that it, it's worth putting that effort in um, you know, to the specific um, campaigns before, before launching it on a large scale. Thanks, Sergio. Right. Yeah, and if I could jump in, just make one, one quick point. We, we were so focused on the number enrolled, but when we take an honest look at it, our study promotions got 1,315 people interested, which is really four times the amount of the 332 enrolled. And um, with those kinds of lessons learned at study outset, maybe we didn't have to reach out to 152,000 emails and 500,000 posts. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So next on the Ultra Lab study workflow is the confirmation of eligibility phone call, and that was that was done to the total number of consent. Um, so a total of 116, which is 17.6 percent, did not complete that COE call, the confirmation of eligibility phone call, and that was because 93 did not respond despite to multiple emails and and phone calls. 22 withdrew at that point, did not want to move forward, and one had to be seized prior to, make, prior to making that COE call. But we did reach 541 participants, which is 82.3% of the total number of consents, uh, which, is, which, which was 657, and they completed the confirmation of eligibility phone call. During that phone call, we determined whether they were eligible or not. So out of those that we completed that phone call with, 209, which is 38.6%, were not eligible. So here we have a list of the reasons why uh, some folks were not eligible. And the biggest, re biggest reason was ha not having the COPD diagnosis, 107. So this was high because we did a lot of um, study promotion with the uh, American Sleep Apnea Association to their community. And so um, a lot of those did were were not eligible because they, they were missing that COPD diagnosis. Um, second on the list was not having a modem on their PAP machine that we but that was required to retrieve that CPAP data. Um, so there were 49 of those. 24 did not have the sleep apnea diagnosis. 16 did not have a PAP. They were not prescribed a PAP, uh, which was a requirement. Four were not over were not 40 or older. Four were on a Trilogy device for their sleep apnea, which is a device that we also couldn't retrieve data from. 
and three did not have either the COPD or the, or the uh, sleep apnea diagnosis, and two were too ill um, or living in the hospice to take part. But we did find 332 that were eligible um, out of the 541 who completed that COE call. Um, and in this study, the, this is the number who were calling uh, enrolled, the, the 332 that were eligible. And Carl, do you want to take this one next? Carl? Yep, there. Okay. Unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So at study outset, we were trying to figure out how best to start up the projects we decided on a, a graduated enrollment plan where we kind of gradually increased over the first several months. Um, and the blue line represents that projection across the study period. You can see that um, with the actual line, which is red, um, we were able to exceed in the beginning. And then about October, we started to fall behind. But we never fell behind by more than a certain amount, which is why we ended up needing two more months at the end of the um, project period. Um, so while this line makes it look really steady and, and easy, the next slide will show the reality of the monthly enrollment, which the blue line shows our really nice um, clean projection and where we start off slowly and get up to 20 and then ramp up to 22 and then to 25 for the last several months of the study. Red shows the reality. And the reality <laughs> was that um, it really fluctuated from, from month to month. And part of this was um, we, what we did with the campaigns is we would apply a campaign, we'd look at the yield and the effectiveness, and then, and then kind of plan the next one and then timing. So there's lots of moving parts about when to engage in a campaign and then how much of, of that audience we should try to reach over what time period. And so I kind of laughed with the study team. If you, if you looked at our main goals to be somewhere between 20 and 25 uh, per month, I think there was only three months out of the 18 month period <laughs> that, we, that we actually were. But we really wanted to show this because this was the reality of doing a large national electronic only uh, recruitment campaign. Um, but then what we show at the bottom is the, e the email blasts that were, were probably the, the, had the biggest impact and, and were the most effective. And um, you can see at the bottom that um, reaching Pelican study folks and going to the ASA list and the COPD PPRN, uh, that's the PPRN that's referenced for April and May. Um, these are really some of our these are some of our best campaigns. Um, so we just wanted to share what what the uh, reality of of this project was on a monthly basis. Want to do this one, Sergio? Or? Yeah. So this is a, a a table like the one we we saw a little bit ago, uh, but this table includes um, the campaigns where we actually had people en enrolled from. And so we've added that column, um, circled enrolled, and, and the percentage of, uh, of enrolled within within that audience. So to summarize, the COPD community is, respons is um, responsible for 162 enrolled participants, which is 49%. The OSA community, 66, uh, a total of 66 enrolled participants, 20%. And from the Bucornet community, there's a total of 58 participants enrolled, 17%. And from miscellaneous, 46%, which is 14%. Um, and Sergio, before you move off, off of this slide, mm -hmm. what's important is, is the methods. And so once we were able to categorize each of the campaign's uh, methods, what we were able to do is take a closer look uh, and, and analyze the effectiveness of each one. Um, so if you want to go to the, the next slide, um, we thought it was important to, to take a look at the effectiveness of, of each of the campaigns. So these are two separate analyses. The first one is comparing the different um, campaigns versus each other. And category one shows um, we had three, we could categorize the email campaigns according to three different um, um, categories. The first is if we were able to email an email list where the participant, the patients had already signed up for being contacted for future research and that they had both, and we knew that they had both sleep apnea and COPD. 
category two were emails that we could send to lists where we knew that folks had already signed up for research or engaged in research, and they had one of the two conditions. And then the third category uh, for email was that we did not know that they signed up for research, so it wasn't part of a PPRN or a, a previous uh, um, research study, um, but we knew that they had one or two of the conditions. And so the important column to look at here is the percent enrolled. So category one was really the COPD PPRN. So we're able to enroll 7% of um, those that we emailed, 60 out of 858. The um, second category had an enrollment percent of 0 0.73, and category three had an enrollment rate of 0 0.07. So you can see the drop off. Um, we also list categories four and five, where we grouped campaigns by Facebook social media and by newsletter inclusion of, of the overlap study. The last column in that top table, we wanted to do a comparison of the comparative effectiveness rate of each of the categories. And we're really curious how much better was going to the COPD PPRN than going to the others. And you can see that going to the um, category one was 10 times more effective than going to e using emails for the category two list. Whereas category one was 100 times more effective than going to category three. So what this tells us is when you sign up for, um, a, when you try to promote from a, a PPRN or other entity that signed up folks for research previously, there's a much higher likelihood that they'll be responsive to this one. Um, while we knew that was probably gonna be the case, now we're able to actually put numbers to it. The second table um, looks at the email enrollment rates, but this time we compare it to in-person uh, recruitment. And the 31% reference value is a value that I've calculated from some of our uh, in-person recruitment here at, um, at UCSD and the VA San Diego. We have three large sleep apnea trials. We have a really unique way of getting new participants when they're suspected of having sleep apnea. They're referred to a group education class. There can be anywhere from six to 12 people in that class. We have one of our um, project coordinators do a five minute presentation and ask for consent to contact to see if they're interested. That's very similar to our overlap study where we're asking for people to register to potentially indicate their interest. And then if they test positive, we um, ask for an in-person informed consent visit. And our, our rates are about 31%. So we've enrolled 522 out of nearly 1,700 people. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's really considered a, a pretty high rate of en enrollment for in-person. So when we look at campaign one, we see that it's that in person is only four times better. I, we I was really impressed with the level of enrollment that we were able to get from the COPD PPRN. When we can combine email campaigns one and two, in person is 22 times better, and one, two, and three, it's over 200 times better. So you can really see the value of signing people up for um, or doing study promotional efforts on folks who are, who are involved in a PPRN. Okay, next slide. Yeah. So, so just to chime in there, I um, this is my favorite message or one of them that has come out of this study, which is really demonstrating the value of the uh, patient-powered research networks and and um, the COPD PPRN um, in particular um, in this particular study. And as Carl referenced, you know, we um, hoped that this would be the case and that we would in fact see a a, a real um, uptake in recruitment from the PPRN, but we were not sure. And now we have numbers to back up, um, you know, that hypothesis that in fact we would do quite well from from a group of people that we not only could identify as having self-report of um, the two conditions, but also um, being committed to wanting to be contacted for research. And so, um, you know, it really demonstrates the the value of um, of setting up um, the PPRN and the ability to then be able to recruit um, in a, uh, you know certainly less expensive way than it would be for you know um, in person, but also you know electronically in a very efficient way. And so I'm I'm really um, appreciative to Carl for for you know going down this road and um, and for really being able to prove the um, the value of the PPRN in terms of recruitment. And so um, in terms of a lesson learned for the future, we definitely um, recommend that 
um, others that take on studies like this, and maybe studies overall, um, consider utilization of, um, of, P P of the PPRNs or PPRN type um, structures because um, we have found that that certainly um, has made an impact um, on recruitment, a positive impact. And, um, and I think there's obviously other benefits to including a patient organization um, in this way. So um, that was a very positive message that came out of this. Agreed. Sir Jeremy, do this one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, it, midway through the project, we were really curious about the geographical distribution of our participants. And at the time we did that, um, we found that the Northeast and the South, the blue and, and the red, um, were quite similar in terms of enrollment rates. Um, what we did was we looked at the number of people that we enrolled and we divided it by the population of that particular United States region. Um, that's why the, the actual percentage is less important than its relative comparison across. So you can see 0.00076 in the Northeast and 74 in the South means approximately similar enrollment rates after you correct for population size. Um, and at that time, the Midwest, so an orange in the West and the green, was about similar too. And we were starting to run out of potential campaigns and we hadn't tapped the P-Scanner CDRN as well as we wanted to. P-Scanner CDRN is comprised of all medical centers that are in the West. And we ultimately went with University of California, San Diego and, and UC Irvine emails. And so that's what put the West up higher at a higher percentage than the others. We also had three folks from Canada uh, involved in the study as well. And this next slide shows our sample characteristics results. Um, so this is on the 332 who were enrolled and it shows that um, sex was pretty equally distributed, 48.5% um, female, 51.5% male. And the mean age was 63.9%, range, ranging from 41 to 89. BMI of over 30, uh, there were a total of 180, out of the 332 that responded yes to that, which is 54.2%. And the race, um, again, out of this 332 was 292 white, 17 African American, 15 multiple race, seven other, and one Asian. And 318 were not Hispanic, 14 were Hispanic. Um, in terms of sexual orientation, 310 said straight, 12 gay, five lesbian, four bisexual, and one declined to answer. And so we also had a question about how long have, um, have you been diagnosed with sleep apnea, with sleep apnea and COPD? Uh, so this is from enrollment. A um, total of 17 um, had just been diagnosed with sleep apnea that year, and 11 had just been diagnosed with COPD that year. 49 had just been diagnosed with sleep apnea within the pa um, in one year from diagnosis, I mean from enrollment, sorry. And 26 had, were diagnosed from COPD one year from enrollment. 96 were diagnosed with sleep apnea between two and five years um, from enrollment, and 109 were diagnosed with COPD two to five years from enrollment, and 66 were diagnosed with sleep apnea um, six to 10 years from enrollment, 73 were diagnosed with COPD six to 10 years from enrollment, and lastly, 103 uh, were diagnosed with sleep apnea 10 years prior, greater than 10 years prior, uh, prior to enrollment, and 112 were diagnosed with COPD greater than 10 years um, prior to enrollment. And we also want to know how many, peop how many people were on supplemental oxygen um, out of the 332, and 144 uh, were on oxygen, which is 44%. 184 were not on oxygen, which is 56%. So 
Carl, can you take this one? Sure, yeah. And so for, um, uh, it's not necessarily medical history, but we were really curious about the level of comorbidity that our um, group had. So we use the functional comorbidity index because based on the focus groups, we realized that um, they were really interested in, in daytime functioning. So this was the closest thing we could find to a comorbidity index that had functional level as the primary outcome. So it was comprised of a list of 18 medical diagnoses that were simply summed such that a higher number represents a higher level of comorbidity. And across the group, the overall average was 6.4 um, medical conditions out of the listed 18. On this uh, functional comorbidity index measure, there was also an opportunity to write in up to 10 additional medical diagnoses. And even though we don't show it here, they, they endorsed two and a half extra on average. So they brought it to eight, eight and a half, a um, little higher across um, uh, both sections of the FCI. So this is a, a, a quite uh, significantly comorbid um, population. And the top five diagnoses are listed here with number one being um, visual impairment uh, affecting 55%, um, obesity affecting just over half, arthritis, PVD, and upper GI disease. Um, when we presented this to our stakeholder advisory group the other day, we were all a little surprised to not see diabetes or hypertension there, um, but hypertension wasn't one of the listed um, diagnoses, uh, although diabetes was. Um, okay. All right. Now going back to our flow chart, the next step after one was uh, enrolled was the uh, CPAP data, data sharing step. Um, so we were success we successfully obtained access to CPAP data or what we call TAG um, for 310 of the 332 enrolled participants. Uh, and so this process, what this process was, is um, contacting their DMEs or HMEs to to give us access to their CPAP data. Um, so there were 22 that were not tagged or we did not get that data. And that was because seven of them, seven of those participants just didn't provide the serial number or DME information we needed to do that. Six was Drew um, at this point. Six had uh, transmitting data transmitting issues and their machine just wasn't transmitting that data. Two were non-responsive at this point and one, one other one had deceased uh, by this stage. So, like I said, we did get access to for three of the ten participants, and and to get access to those, we had to contact 132 different uh, DME or HME organizations. Um, so the tables below, the first table shows the number of participants per DME. So there were 94 participants with only one of our with only one participant. Um, there were Next, there were 11 uh, uh, DMEs with two uh, in each, two participants uh, in each of those. Then there were nine DMEs or HMEs with three to 10 of our participants and five DME, uh, DMEs with more than 10 of our participants. And the, the table on the right to that shows a list of those DMEs with more than 10 of our participants. Um, the one on top is the what we call the overlap DME. So what that is is people who participants who did not have a DME were not associated with one or no one was um, actively monitoring them. We ended up picking them up and adding them to our um, CPAP data platform directly. So we uh, we had 69 participants there, and then the next. Uh, DME with with high number is Lincare. Uh, Lincare held 37 of our participants. Um, next is Apria, which had 28 of our participants, and then VAs, uh, 14 of our participants, and Sleep Data with 11 of our participants. And so, just to summarize the uh, the CPAP data sharing. Um, so we, this is this 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 phase has um, quite a few of our lessons learned. 
um, throughout the study, we had to improve the, the package we faxed to the DMEs with a more detailed cover letter, uh, copy the consent forms, um, and even instructions on how to add um, a, a DME or, or a, a lab or a physician in order to, for, in order to allow us to, to, to get access to that data. We also modified our consent form language to include a piece about um, the D sharing that information or retrieving that information from the DMEs. We also added a HIP authorization to release records. Um, and we worked closely with AAR, AA Home Care to facilitate discussions with key contacts to the, lar to the larger DME companies. can take this one. So, so just some quick background is that we knew when we wrote the grant that trying to get the CPAP data um, as part of this trial was going to be super challenging. And in fact, we wrote it so that we were going to use some sort of proxy device, this device that plugged into a, an electrical outlet that could get a proxy measure of CPAP use because then we, it would be easier for us. Um, after talking to the community and, and, and really the, the entire team appreciating the increased scientific rigor of getting the actual CPAP data, we said, let's do it. And so we knew going in, we may need to contact 330 separate DMEs. Uh, in the end, like Sergio showed, we contacted 132. We had a lot of lessons learned because this was not an easy aspect of, of the study. And looking back on it, early planning is essential. We really should have brought in an, an uh, AA Home Care, which is an umbrella DME organization or other similar organizations earlier in working with them. Uh, it was They were critical in getting us some contacts at some of the larger national organizations. Um, earlier on, we should have better understood the barriers and issues facing working with clinical service providers who are under time demands competition demands, had concerns about uh, data breaches, and you know, generally were, were hesitant to, to work with us on, on the study. Um, but what we did is we consulted with a lot of different stakeholders, and we list, uh, there's a pretty good list, um, not just our study team, our stakeholder advisory board, our IRB staff, healthcare attorneys, uh, we talked to some of the individual DME organizations to better understand their concerns. Um, we mentioned AA Home Care, uh, some of the national patient advocacy associations like AARC, HIPAA specialists, and the CPAP manufacturers themselves. And in talking with all these folks, that's what helped us come up with ideas, implement those ideas to, to, to help do that data sharing. Um, so we probably could spend a whole, whole talk on that, but we'll, we'll limit it to that. Next slide. All right. Okay, so next is the randomization and intervention phase. So here show, we show that we randomized a total of 294 participants, um, which is 88.6%, and 100, 153 uh, fell into the proactive care arm of the study, which included a respiratory therapist phone call, um, access to the Curricul the online curriculum, which is a group of seven modules and lessons, um, web-based access to the CPAP adherence data, weekly peer coaching calls from the COPD information line, and as well as a follow-up call from the respiratory therapist. And then 141 participants uh, fell into the reactive care arm. They had that respiratory, inter respiratory therapist introductory call, but they did not have um, the, the, the coaching um, or, or access to the curricu curriculum. Uh, they did though get access to their CPAP data adherence. And so of the 153 that were proactive arm, um, again, they had their respiratory intro call at week one, 151 of those RT intro calls were completed. They also had the five week uh, five weeks of coaching calls from the information line coach um, to help them guide guide them through the curriculum and one hundred and twenty participants fully completed the curriculum. The respiratory th therapist uh, also called them again after the curriculum, and so ninety three 
uh, a total of 93 uh, follow phone calls were completed. The participants had an op had had a, had, a, had the option of of completing a satisfaction survey after uh, a study staff communication by phone or or uh, one of our chat functions in the PON portal, and th these are some scores uh, for um, results from that surveys. Um, the information line coach uh, did a total of nine chat communications and 463 phone calls, and the chat communication was scored at 8.2 percent, and the phone call was scored at 9.5. Sorry, not percent. These are uh, averages: 8.2 percent chat, 9.5 phone calls. And again, this is a scale from zero to ten, so that's that's very good. Respiratory that respiratory therapist coach calls were scored. Chat 9.7, phone 9.5. Again, from zero to ten. So this just speaks to 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 the calls I made and 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 um, um, how well those calls went. Um, and there were a total of 895 uh, surveys completed. Carl, Alicia, anything you want to add here? Oh, just that it was super impressed to get that kind of feedback. Um, I thought those were really high levels of, of satisfaction with the intervention as it was yeah. delivered by the, the info line coaches and respiratory therapists. So it was great to see. Yeah. yeah, agreed. And again, I think this goes back to the study model that we talked about at the very beginning, right? The, the specific contacts and people um, that are potentially going to enroll. And then once they are enrolled, you know, feel uncomfortable with those points of contact. So. Um, so I think that that's a really important sort of measurement. Agreed. Yeah. All right. And last on the study workflow is the baseline and follow-up assessments. Um, so in total, baselines combined between RC and PC group, there were a total of 282 baselines completed, which is 95.9%. Um, and combined again, uh, six week follow ups, uh, there were a total of 262 sur uh, follow up surveys completed, uh, which is 89.1%, and 12 week follow up surveys combined, there were a total of 239 surveys completed, which is 81.3%. And I should comment, we've done other uh, um, web based projects and the data completion rates did not approach 80%. So the fact that we get 90, 95% um, and then 80% is, is impressive. Okay, and now some of the results. So with the data sharing, we talked about getting access to the data, but then once we got the data, it actually took quite a bit to get it cleaned up. Um, we got it from two different providers and um, the study just closed on October 31st. So this is, this is hot off the press and we haven't had a chance to look at some of the other measures quite yet. But the thing that really sticks out is, uh, well, what we show here are three measures. Um, the amount of CPAP use, so how many hours um, per night it was used over um, a particular time period. So baseline was the 30 nights prior to randomization, six weeks or the six weeks post, and then 12 weeks were um, inclusive of, of all 12 weeks. And then the AHI level, which is the apnea hypopnea index, and that stands for the number of events per hour of sleep, and it's measured by the CPAP device itself, and CPAP leak. And that refers to the amount of leak that might be, or air that might be escaping between the mask and the skin. And there's always some levels, um, but it should stay below a threshold of about 24 liters per minute. So when we look back at the use level at baseline, this is the thing that really sticks out for this study, which is that on average, the folks were using it almost seven hours per night. I've been doing CPAP adherence research for a long time and US-based studies, uh, most control groups are somewhere between two and three and with some sort of intervention, you can get folks up to four and five. It's very rare to get to six and here we have almost seven. There are some European studies that report rates that uh, are above six, but those are rare as well. So there's something really unique going on with this population that, um, is, is that we'll talk about over the next couple of slides. Um, the AHI was below five. Um, just so everyone knows, the 
if you're between zero and five, you're considered to be in the quote unquote normal range. Five to 15 is considered the mild range. So these are really, even at baseline, these are really well controlled folks. Um, their HIs were, were quite low on therapy, which is a great sign. And leak, there might have been a difference on leak between the PC and RC groups at baseline. Um, and it looks like we were able to help reduce the, the leak of the PC group a little bit, but all groups were, or, or both groups were below the threshold of, of 24. So they had good control over their leak as well. Okay, next slide. So the, the key finding with this study is really the high baseline average use level. And as we query demonstration project, we really wanted to focus not just on the study, but on the process as well, which is why we talk about some of the lessons learned in conducting this study. And in trying to condense this project with all that needed to be done in a three month period, we had an 18 month time period to conduct this really large ambitious clinical study of 332 people. When we started, we wanted to have the opportunity to potentially introduce more stringent entry criteria. For example, trying to get people who are using the machine less um, or perhaps more diversity in the sample that we were able to obtain. But because of the time frame and the way we were recruiting, we could never quite get to that point. So it results in, in a relatively high baseline mean level of, of CPAP use. So the next thing we wanna look at is how about the variability of that use? So what are other ways to look at uh, the CPAP data that we have? So we thought, let's start with, um, well, what I should say is in conducting the research studies I've done in the past, we've only had one person out of nearly 2000 who's averaged 10 hours per night. And I think on this study, we had 30 or 40 people who averaged over uh, 10 hours per night. So there's something very unique going on with this group. So we thought, let's take a look at the CPAP use level and reported sleep periods. Next slide. A quick background on this is that CPAP is prescribed for use during sleep. And in the majority of patients who use it, they typically use it for some portion of their total sleep period, but not usually more than their total sleep period. Um, some folks we've heard about will use CPAP during the day, not, you know, during non-sleep periods, because they kind of like how it feels and makes them breathe a little bit better if they feel like they're congested or something. Um, but on the whole, people tend to use it during sleep and usually not for the entire sleep period. So if you could fast forward to the next one, next slide. This shows the, the graph that comes from uh, one of the CPAP manufacturers' websites and is one of our study participants. What it shows is each going across the horizontal axis is one day, and on the vertical axis is a 24-hour period. So it goes from 12 noon to 12 noon, uh, represents one 24-hour period. And what I did was, or what we did was we put the box around um, what is probably the, the main sleep period for this person. May not be perfect, may be off by a little bit, but generally it looks like nine to four, something like that. So all the green bar represents CPAP use. So all of the use from noon to 8 p.m. above the blue box, and all of the use from 4 a.m. To, to noon uh, in the morning is probably uh, during non-sleep periods for this person. Th this is something we normally don't see, this, this level of, of use. Okay, if you can go back. So we calculated total sleep period as just the uptime minus the bedtime. So when someone puts their head down and then when they get out of bed, they reported to us what their, what their average uh, normal uptime and bedtime was. And that, that we considered that the total sleep period. We then calculated a ratio to say what percentage of that period was CPAP use. So we divide that CPAP use by total sleep period. And on average, across all the people in our study, the average was 90%. We've never seen rates this high in CPAP adherence studies. So something was going, going on. We also noticed that that value ranged up to 2.4 times. So what that means is if someone had a um, total sleep period that they reported of six hours or seven hours, they were using CPAP 12 or 14 hours in the day. Um, so clearly they're using CPAP well beyond uh, than just during sleep. When we looked at the ratio of 1.0, so using CPAP for their entire reported sleep period, 35% of the people, over 100 people of the sample, used it more than just during their sleep period. Um, when, next slide, and then the following slide. 
when we presented this to our stakeholder advisory board, um, folks were, were, were pretty impressed, said they had never quite seen data like this before. And one question that came up was, is adherence related to COPD severity? So we, we took that subgroup, that 35% that who had a use ratio of over 1.0, and we looked at the relationship and sure enough, there's a significant correlation between adherence and COPD severity. So we wonder if there's something unique to COPD patients that um, causes them to um, use CPAP a lot more during the day during their non-sleep periods. Next slide. So lessons learned on the study results. This may be one of the first data sets that's found very high levels of CPAP use during non-sleep periods and very high levels across the 24-hour period. We were not aware of any evidence in the medical literature when we were putting this grant proposal together that indicates that, that overlap syndrome patients use CPAP in this way and to this extent. So we're meeting as a, a study team to learn more about how to approach this because it's so different than the data reported in, in other CPAP studies. Um, we would have loved to have a greater range of use levels, um, but we were limited with the 18 month time frame for this. So, um, so we're really excited about the data that we have and we look forward to trying to um, learn more about what, what, what we have here. Next slide. Um, so, so overall, Oh, sure. So overall, in terms of, of lessons learned, we've sort of already gone through each of the categories for you. But, but for this um, particular demonstration project, the inclusion of the initial focus groups was critically important, but it also had significant implications on the study itself and um, how we moved forward. And um, after we conducted those, we really had to um, look back at what we asked. And we don't want to ask something and then not um, take recommendations that are that are consistent and clear. And so we had to significantly change and the study itself, it was an improvement for sure, um, but it certainly had implications on um, how we conducted the study, um, how we planned for the study, and our timeline for the study, and, and certainly budgetary implications as well. And so, um, sort of in hindsight, we we would definitely recommend that prep to research work be conducted and be conducted in collaboration with um, a patient organization. But I do think, um, and I think the study team overall would agree that that. Um, we could have benefited from another um, sort of redesign and gone back to um, to the funder and talked about you know this being a, a maybe different model and different type of study than we had originally planned. Um, having said that, you know again, I just want to stress the importance of those focus groups and the patient input and and the fact that it did make it um, a better study and we're really lucky to have been able to do that. And go to the next slide, for Jeff. Um, so just um, wanted to thank everybody, um, especially wanted to thank Carl. I um, just the the enormous um, amount of time and energy and um, passion that went into this um, project is just incredible. And I really um, just want to you know thank thank Carl especially, and certainly want to thank um, Bill Clark and Adam um, Amdar. You guys were amazing, and um, and also um, Sergio for all of his work in coordinating this project and certainly um, you guys can read the collaborators and advocacy organizations but a special thanks you know certainly to our funder um, you know Pecori. this was really um, an exceptional team and I'm just really proud that the foundation was was able to be part of this so I just want to thank everybody the information line folks the RTs you know anyway we're running out of time but really want to thank everybody and um, and also wanted to just show you the the breadth of who was on our stakeholder advisory board. You all can see that, but it was a, a wealth of different stakeholders from patient groups to medical professional societies to you know pharma um, to other advocacy advocacy groups. Um, really, just trying to get um, the the breadth of the stakeholders, keeping the patient um, you know in the center. Carl, did you want to add to that? I didn't want to. Yeah, I want to give a, a big thank, thank you to you too, because we, as, as another study challenge, we lost our co-PI midway through the, the study and Alicia stepped in and, and it was really a team effort to, to, to make this, this project a success and everyone can see the large number of people that were involved and everyone contributed in a, in a really large way. So it's been a great project and super exciting and we're really blazing some new ground with it. So it was really a, a big team effort.
So I think at this point, uh, oh, and, and, and also a special thank you to Sergio because we also lost our main project coordinator midway through the project and Sergio hit the ground running. They say you're throwing in a deep end. He was actually thrown in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to, uh, to get started on this. So <laughs> he did a wonderful job. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And it is time. Um, I, don't, I don't see any questions or comments in the chat, chat box, but are there any um, by phone clarification questions or comments? Yeah, if you can unmute everybody. So is, it, is it open to the to the group yeah, now? Yeah, everyone's unmuted now. If there's anyone who would oh, like to, to comment or ask a question. May I ask a question? Yeah. I wonder if the heavy usage of the CPAP had a lot to do with people knowing that they were part of a study. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, and that's why oftentimes we run studies like this. We have a, a control group. Um, what we did was um, we looked at the baseline data for folks, and you do raise a good question. So we looked at the 30 days prior to getting enrolled in the study, um, but, but it is true they might have known during some portion of those 30 days that they were going to be enrolled. So we, we could go back to the data that we have and, and go back farther than 30 days, because as you saw on the one slide, I think it's about 80% of our participants had been diagnosed with sleep apnea for two or more years. So um, we could go back and take a look at that. But, but if, if that baseline data holds, and, and it truly is representative of their levels of use before the intervention, then it's still it's still pretty high, but that's a good question. We 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 could potentially go go look at that. Yeah, because it's it's interesting. I um just started using a CPAP for the second time, and and I don't really have any um, um side effects from C, from uh, COPD yet. So I'm just interested that later on, if it worsens, that maybe people choose to use the CPAP over the oxygen you know being told you need oxygen it's like a big decision it's scary so i just wonder mm. if some people who aren't breathing so well are using the the uh, cpap more to augment their medicine or whatever i'm just it's just a thought this yeah. is teresa um i did some of the rt calls with these folks and it seemed to me that that was the case and we also we stressed with them to please do not fall asleep without your CPAP. Make sure you're putting it on. And a lot of the people reported sleeping a lot, that they were just at that point of their disease or whatever, that where they needed that sleep. And we begged them never to uh, fall asleep without it because it would hurt, you know, the overall benefits. Right, so we, right. We right. stressed it and stressed it and stressed it. So that may have something to do with it. I don't know. It's very right. interesting, though. Very interesting numbers there. It really is. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised at that. Uh, so it didn't count for all the people like me that occasionally fall asleep in their chair watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you wake up with, and you say, oh, my God. Yeah, I know. My God, I need my CPAP on. Oh dear. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I should put it next to my chair. <laughs> right. <laughs> I could yeah. do that. But yeah, I'm really surprised that um, people being so diligent, so good about it. You know, I know people who hardly ever use it, and they have one. And I just have problems getting used to it between the rain out and um, the nose thing, and you know. Um, it's mm -hmm. just, it's really a tough thing to get used to. Yeah, it sure is. So it's interesting that people would, hmm? Yeah, that's why these levels were so surprising. Yeah, I'm surprised that people would find you so comfortable because I just don't. And I don't mm -hmm. sleep through the whole night. I might sleep four or five hours and I don't even know I take it out. And I'm just amazed that. I wonder, oh, by the way, did you find out what kind of CPAP device they're using? I'm using the nasal pillows, and I find it much more comfortable than I did with the mask. Did you find out what they're using and, and which ones lasted the longest on their device? 
I don't think they measured that. No, because no, I, I mean that's really asked. important. We, we did yeah. collect that data. We we asked, um, you know, what type of mask they were using, whether it be the nasal or the full face or the nasal pillow. Yeah. I think yeah. it's a very interesting thing to look at because um, it makes a big difference for people. You know, they just can't adapt to the one and they don't try the other. But, you know, I know my husband, oh, he went through every single thing they had and nothing yeah. worked for him. Everything. Right. So he would have been really bad for this, depending on which one he was using at the time. But, I mean, I think it's really mm. valid. It might also help. Maybe it'll help these manufacturers figure out what's the most comfortable for people. I think your data could be a little valuable. You made some ching ching out of it. <laughs> yeah. it, it really is. Yeah, you know, it, it really is so different for each individual. It's like we always say a, a face is like a snowflake. There's no two alike. And so well, that's what's true. Going, what's going to work yeah. for someone's nostrils is going to not work for them. I know it. It's just yeah. really rough, isn't it? But yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to know. Are you gonna publish something? Are you doing an abstract, a paper? Or are you gonna be doing something that we can look up later? Yeah, yeah, we should have several manuscripts um, out there, uh, hopefully within the next few months if possible. Will you let but, us know? Yeah, yeah, we sure can, absolutely. But just to okay, go back so to I just done a too, general thing, pardon? Oh yeah, in, in in regards to your point, we did in a in a separate study, we kept track of the number of, of masks masks. Um and on average people used two and a half masks over the first two months. We thought that was really important because some DMEs and some well some policies of insurers is to really limit the number of, of masks. And it's so important that patients get to try multiple ones right. in an ideal situation they get to try multiple at the dme itself just to get a feel for it because they don't know the difference between the nasal and the nose and a, and a right and a close, you know and then and then sleeping with it's a whole different matter and so that's really important so you know that one study we did two and a half and then what we find is people will have two and three and four and five of these you know masks and different interfaces at home and they're using different ones because we really wanted to see was anyone better than the other and it was really right. hard to know which night which one was being used so that's why for this study we didn't necessarily collect that all right data. right yeah. yeah it's true but, it's individual it is it is and 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 years ago when i tried it they didn't have the nasal pillows and they have it this yeah. time and it really makes a difference by the way yeah. very interesting but this um, sleep the the lady who who fitted me she says the best thing if the nose thing hurts is to use vitamin A and D diaper rash lotion. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. she worked at a place for a lot of people, you know, where inpatients, ICU, and, she, mm -hmm. and it does, it that works pretty good. I bought some. <laughs> yep, <laughs> great. I know, great. I know, it's that weird diaper rash cream. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. I, huh? Yeah, no, thanks for recommending that. Yeah, that's, I hadn't heard that one before. Yeah, I found it very interesting, though. I used to work in research and um, and interviewing mm. and that, and so I appreciate all the work you went through. And you do have to bug people. One interesting thing I found when I did a lot of it is if I placed a product with a senior citizen and it was food, like 90% of them completed it. Mm. If it involved food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yep, interesting. No kidding, and especially spicy food because I think their taste buds are dying. But yeah, for senior citizens, anything involving food, um, they they almost all completed it. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little uh, interesting point there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much yeah. for taking time to speaking with me. I look forward to sure. reading an abstract of paper about it. Okay. Thank are you. Are you on the okay. COPD mailing list? Because well, that'll be one source to to look at. Yes, I am. So it's going to show up on okay. there, right? Yep. Yes, oh. we'll post it on. on well, we can we can post uh, information on our, our 360 social, and we'll also send it out through the through the mailing list. So, um, so we'll make sure that it gets out to the community once it's uh, once it's available. Is that okay, Carl? Yeah. Okay. Yep, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Any, bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> bye. Thank Any you. Any other questions or comments? All right. 
Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you all, Carl, Alicia. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.